This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Would you open your Bibles with me this morning to the book of Exodus? Exodus 25, 23 to 30 is our text. Exodus 25, 23 to 30 is our text. And I really want to uh, encourage you this morning for those who are here and joining us on the live stream. Well done for not going to the mountains and the seas and coming to church this morning. Amen? Well done. Uh, you had a choice to be in a million different places, but you heard God's call and you were, you were just joyful, joyful to come and worship with fellow believers. And I believe God has a message for us and it's going to be good. Amen. If you have found uh, the text, please say Christ likeness. Would you rise with me as I read God's word this morning in reverence for his word? Exodus 25, 23 to 30. Make a table of acacia wood, two cubits long, a cubit wide, and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold and make a gold molding around it. Also make around it a rim, a handbreadth wide, and put a gold molding on the rim. Make four gold rings for the table and fasten them to the four corners where the four legs are. The rings are to be close to the rim to hold the poles used in carrying the table. Make the poles of acacia wood, overlay them with gold and carry the table with them and make its plates and dishes of pure gold as well as its pitchers and bowls for the pouring out of offerings. Put the bread of the presence on this table to be before me at all times. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may take a seat. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for the presence and power of your spirit. Illuminate our hearts to receive your word of truth today. And may it convict us, encourage us, comfort us, lead us on into truth. And may the truth set us free. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're in the series of God's Tabernacle in Me, and today is part 18. And if you have missed any of the sermons, you can go back to our YouTube channel and check them out for yourselves. Uh, we're studying God's Tabernacle because the Tabernacle of God uh, that the Israelites received uh, in the Old Testament, which became the temple uh, and is now the church of Jesus Christ, is a model of heaven. And every piece of furniture that God commanded the Israelites to make has significance with Jesus Christ. And it points to Jesus. It points to who has atoned for our sins and who has made the way for us to live. We continue today uh, in uh, our series with the table of showbread. Everyone say with me, the table of showbread. And the title of today's message is this, bread of life or bread half cooked. Bread of life or bread half cooked. And hopefully throughout the message, uh, as, uh, as we dive deeper, you'll understand the meaning of the title. Let me ask you a question though. How many of you have ever had guests over for lunch or dinner at your home? Any, any one of you? Yep, okay, good. So being a host, or a hostess, and entertaining guests is not an easy job. Ask anyone who had to clean the house, you know, and you find uh, the stuff that you lost five years ago as you were cleaning the house and preparing the food and the menu and just checking to see if the food fits the guests and there's no dietary restrictions and whatnot. Uh, it's, it's catered to uh, really uh, giving the, the guest a good time, a fun time of fellowship around the table. And food is such an important part of who we are. Can I get an amen? Uh, we, we all need nourishment, food for our bodies, food for our souls. So obviously you want to have everything or in order as you invite the guest. But let's just imagine your, your main menu is, um, let's say, roasted turkey or roasted pork, okay? And that's your main menu of the night. And as you're about to take it out of the oven, you find out that your meat is half cooked. Yes, that is exactly the response. No, it can't be right. <laughs> because half cooked meat 
cannot be served because of many reasons. Uh, first off, you, you might get sick, and second off, it's not going to be very enjoyable, uh, and so you can't serve that food. Just being uh, in, in that situation kind of makes you cringe and be like, okay, what, what's, what's the phone number for the nearest pizza shop so we can at least get some food on the table for our guests? See, having food half-cooked will not serve its purpose of feeding the guest. Uh, does that make sense? Serving food that is half-cooked uh, does not uh, fulfill the vision, uh, does not fulfill the destiny of that food, which is created to nourish people. We believe through God's word that Jesus is the bread of life because he says he is. He is the nourishment from heaven. And he provides for us uh, the, the best meal or the best kind of nourishment any human being can ever have. Why? Physical food will give you a little bit of comfort for a little bit of time. And you will have to eat that food again. It's the same with water. We, we need water for our bodies. And please feel free to hydrate because today is going to be a hot day. But after a while, you need more water. You need more. Uh, but the nourishment from heaven is the nourishment that our souls are seeking, and Jesus himself is our nourishment. Throughout the Bible, bread is very important. How many of you like bread? Uh, you raise your hand? Yeah, okay, good. If you didn't raise your hand, I'd be curious to know why. <laughs> but I, I like bread too, uh, and bread is important. So let me teach you what bread is in the original language of the Hebrew of the Old Testament, which is lechem. Everyone say lechem. Lechem, okay, so that's bread. Uh, and Jesus talks about bread, but in the Old Testament, we know that there is bread in the tabernacle, in the Mishkan. The table of showbread is where the bread is presented to God, presented to God. When we find in Leviticus chapter 24 that you need to have a certain type of bread that is made in a certain type of way and presented in the way that God has commanded. Twelve loaves, simply put, 12 loaves of bread that represent the 12 tribes of Israel are presented on the table of showbread in stacks of six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And it is sprinkled with frankincense. And you can just imagine with your holy imagination the, the smell of fresh bread. Anyone? Oh, fresh bread with frankincense. And it just, it just overwhelms that place. And it is presented unto the Lord. There is a way that this bread is cooked, and I'll get to that in a moment. But look in verse 30 of our text this morning. We read, put the bread of presence on this table to be before me at all times. At all times, present this bread to me at all times. That is God's commandment. That means there is no shortage of bread at the, bread, at the table of showbread. It will always be filled up by the priests, and it will always be made by the people of God who bring it into uh, the tabernacle. Now, it's important for us to know lechem, which is bread, because it's one of the most common denominators of any language, any culture. We always gather around food. And our church family, we have a great culture of doing potlucks. We bring foods from different kinds of, you know, families bring it, and we, we enjoy each other's food, and it's, it's just so wonderful. Uh, like I said, I have a friend who's very new to our church, and he said, I've gained 20 pounds, Pastor, 20 pounds coming to this church, because he's been, he's been here almost every time the church doors are open, and we usually have food, and, it, and it's wonderful to be able to grow in the Lord, <laughs> to grow in the uh, spiritually <laughs> Physically, emotionally, mentally, to grow in the Lord. Now, of course, we, we do it with moderation, of course, of course. Self-control, fruit of the Spirit, amen? Now, this bread is, is important because God wants his people to be nourished. We know that this bread is presented to God, but at the same time, God wants to nourish the priests who have worked hard in the courtyard area to serve the Lord. And when they come in, they, they're washed up, 
and they, they are hungry, they're famished. And so they're able to come to the table of showbread and they're able to feast because God has given what has been given to the Lord to them for their nourishment. And this is an important concept. The Lord wants his people to present this bread, the stacks of bread unto him. But by the way, God doesn't eat bread. Anyone? Does he need your bread? Does he need your money? He doesn't need us, really. He is fully content. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one, perfect unity and harmony. He is able to do far better than we could ever accomplish. But he created us for relationships so that we may partner with him in his mission. And so, ironically speaking, the bread that is lifted up unto God, God gives it right back to his people, especially with the priests. Especially with the priests. And we've learned that we are the royal priesthood now. Amen? Now we're a New Testament people. Jesus has come, and the veil has been torn. Now we have access to the Father. We don't need to go through a mediator. Uh, we have Jesus, our chief mediator, chief priest. And he is the most high priest who has welcomed us in to relationship with God. So that means we have access to the bread of life, Jesus Christ. The bread of life, Jesus Christ. Christ. Now I want to share with you the recipe for making the showbread. The recipe for making showbread. Uh, it's kind of a flat bread, and I've done some research on this. Uh, and back in the ancient Near East, uh, you know, they didn't have ovens as, as we do nowadays. Uh, they used to cook in pots, and they would put a fire inside the pot, and with the heat, they would uh, make a dough uh, and put it uh, on the on the side of the pot. And the heat would uh, make, it, make it into bread as we know it. Now, the recipe is this. In Leviticus 24, verse 5, we read this. Take the finest flour, and finest is what's important. Finest flour and bake 12 loaves of bread, using two-tenths of an ephah for each loaf. You need to use the finest flour, which means it's not coarse flour. It's not just any flour that you get. It has to be grinded and grinded and grinded so that it's very, very fine. Can you imagine the finest of flour? It's almost as if if you put some in your hand and you blow it and it goes up into the air. It's so fine. There is significance to the fine flour. Also in Leviticus 2.4, if you bring a grain offering baked in an oven, it is to consist of the finest flour, either thick loaves made without yeast, and with olive oil, mixed in with thin loaves made without yeast and brushed with olive oil. The bread has to, made, has to be made with oil. It needs flour and it needs oil. And we know that throughout the Bible, oil is always connected to whom? The anointing of the Holy Spirit. Okay? The anointing of the Holy Spirit. So uh, fine grounded flour with oil. And also you need to add what? Anyone want to try? Salt. Salt. Leviticus 2.13. Season all your grain offerings with salt. Isn't it wonderful that the Old Testament connects so perfectly with the New? Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. Amen? And if the salt loses its saltiness, it's not good for anything but to be thrown out and to be trampled by men. Has anyone tasted uh, salt that has lost its saltiness before? And you would probably say no, because why would you taste that anyway? It's useless. Salt is important because it is not only a preservative, but it adds flavor. Let me ask you a question. Does your life add flavor to the kingdom of God? Does your life add flavor? And is your life a preservative? that protects the unity of the body of Jesus Christ? Or are you an additive that adds fuel to the flame in a negative way? I believe all of us here at DCM, we are with the salt, and we have not lost our saltiness by the grace of God. Amen? So we need flour, we need oil, we need salt, uh, but there are two things that you cannot put into this bread that goes on the table of showbread. Two things. It comes in Leviticus 2.11. Uh, 
Every grain offering you bring to the Lord must be made without yeast. Everyone say yeast. For you are not to burn any yeast or honey in a food offering presented to the Lord. When you hear the word yeast or leaven, as it were, uh, we, we know that in the Bible, leaven is always connected with sin. Because a little leaven rises the bread, and it's the same with sin. Just a little bit, a sprinkling of sin will do what? Will contaminate the whole batch. It's the same with our body. Well, pastor, I, I'm not sinning as much as Mr. Smith down the road, so I, I'm probably good, right? Because he sins like 100. I'm like at a level 2. He's a level 100. I'm a level 2. He's a level 1,000. I'm a level 3. So in comparison, I'm, I'm only sinning a little bit compared to him. So I'm okay, right? Well, how, how much poop in your coffee would you allow? Like 0.001 milligrams of a little bit of, I'm sorry to make you feel all so good this morning with my illustration, but it's certainly waking you up. No amount of poo is good for my coffee or tea, just like it is for you. No amount. Same thing. God has called us to a holy life. Don't you know that your bodies are the temple of the living God, the spirit of God? We are the tabernacle. We are the temple of the living God. We are the church of Jesus Christ. We have been bought with a price. My life is not my own. So how dare I compare myself with other people? That should not be. But second of all, how dare I try to defile the temple of the living God with small bits and pieces and I make up the standard? Lord, forgive me. Because the standard is God's word. And according to God's word, he says to us, be holy for I am holy. It doesn't say you can be 99%. You can be 99.99%. God asks us to be fully surrendered and submitted to his will. So yeast is not allowed in the batch of bread. And this is something, uh, an extra thing that I want you to know, uh, and this is something that I want you to really grab a hold of today. Do you think the bread presented to God was half-baked or half-cooked? Anyone want to guess? Do you think it was three-quarters cooked? Do you think it was nine-tenths cooked? Or do you think the people of God who are making this bread to be presented to the Lord, that they would... Uh, somehow time it perfectly, that it's perfectly cooked on both sides and the inside is cooked as well. What do you think? Perfectly cooked or half cooked? Let's take a poll. Perfectly cooked. Okay, good. Well done. I agree with you. I believe that the loaves that were presented to God were not half cooked. They were not half baked. It's the same with us as followers of Jesus. The problem with today's Christianity, at least in America, at least in New England, as I observe it, is that there are far too many half-baked Christians who talk the talk, but do not walk the talk. There are far too many that are only cooked on one side, but the other side is left raw. There are too many powerless Christians or so-called Christians and say, I, I believe in Jesus, I, I trust him. But your characters haven't been formed or developed into the maturity that God wants for us. Are you bearing the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness? All of those things and self-control against these things, there is no law, the word of God tells us. Are we bearing those fruits or do we live by impulse? Man does not live by impulse alone. Oh, let me rephrase that. Man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that protrudes out of God's mouth. Maybe we are half-baked because we don't eat the bread of life enough. Perhaps we're half-baked because we're not willing to go into the fire of God's love and be in that furnace, whether it be suffering, whether it be patience, whether it be perseverance that God is trying to raise up in us. There are far too many half-baked Christians which hurt the witness of God. We present a gospel and say, this is how we ought to live. But they observe your life, our life, my life, and they see so much disconnect. 
So they say, well, your life is not, not very different to my life, so why would I want to follow the Jesus that you follow? Brothers and sisters, do we have leaven in our lives that rise up against God? Do we have pride? Do we have prejudices? Do we have certain ideas that come against God? Some ideas that come against the word of God. It's really simple. Just accept the word of God as the spirit of God leads you. The full counsel of God. Just accept it to be true. Because he is true. And God will never fail us. And God does not lie. But there is a deceiver of our souls who wants to take you away from the truth, take you away from community, take you away from accountability, take you away from small groups. Why? Because I preach this on Wednesday. The fool, according to Proverbs, will always pull away. Why? Because they're selfish, right? Because if, you, if I'm not in close proximity with you, you can't see what I'm doing, and I like my sin, so I'm going to stay away. Guess what? The more you stay away, the further you'll get. But God invites us in and welcomes us back. Come back, son. Come back, daughter. Is there any leaven in our lives this morning? Because that will be one of the things that God does not want. Because you might act all holy on a Sunday morning, but when it gets to that Friday afternoon, what's happening? If I asked your family members, they could be Christians or they might not be. But if I did, a, did an interview with them and I, I asked them, so is Christ likeness coming out of so and so? And they say, well, sometimes yes, sometimes no. If they say not really, but they go to church once a week and they seem to kind of check the list and check the box, that would be very, very sad. Because whatever we give unto the Lord is what God wants to provide back for us. If we do the right thing in preparing the bread as God has instituted through his word, which is all good, by the way, this is all good stuff, then the Lord will say, listen, I've received your heart, and I give it to you for your fulfillment. We see that in Jesus. Jesus, son of God, son of man, fully God, fully man, came in the fullness of time to this earth. And you might not grasp, how can that even be? God becoming flesh, and I'm with you. I don't understand it either. It's a mystery. But God has given me and us the grace to believe that Jesus came to this earth 2,000 some years ago. He lived a sinless life. He proclaimed the gospel. He preached deliverance, healing, salvation. And he died a sinner's death on the cross for my sins and yours. He rose again from the dead. And now we look forward to his second return. He will not return as a babe. He will come riding on the clouds. He will come in full judgment. He will come to judge the living and the dead. And for us, that's a great judgment day. Why? Because we'll be rewarded. Hallelujah. Everything that you've done without anyone knowing, loving people, caring for people, praying for people, serving people, he will reckon all of that and reward because my God is a rewarder. But for those who have not walked with the Lord and been sinning while no one's been looking, every word, every intent, Every deed will be reckoned. That's a frightful moment. The good news is, even if your life is in that place, you can still come to the cross today. The cross, Jesus, still invites us, sinners, to come back. Backsliders to come back. You can't say, well, I'm just too far from the Lord, Pastor. God's hand is not too short. He'll be able to embrace as long as you come with a repentant heart, with a heart that is totally turned over to God. One other reason I think 
the, the bread was not half-baked is because uh, the word of God has uh, some uh, backings to this. In Hosea, Hosea chapter 7, verse 8, uh, we read this. Uh, Ephraim mixes with the nations. Ephraim is a flat loaf not turned over. In a different translation, we read this. Ephraim compromises with the nations. He's a half, half-baked cake. Everyone say half-baked cake. So what Ephraim is doing is compromising his faith with other faiths and just mixing them all. And it's called syncretism, by the way, where you just mix. Well, I, I'll, take a, I'll take an ounce of that and a pound of this. It's like you're, you're standing at the deli counter, right? Let me get a quarter pound of that cheese and, and a half a pound of that. And this. It doesn't work that way. There is exclusivity in the gate. There is only one way into the tabernacle. That is the east gate. Jesus says, I am the gate. There is no other way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's only one door. And you can't make a hole in one of these areas and just climb in. You can't jump over. That's illegitimate. We can only come through Jesus. And I believe Jesus did not give a half sacrifice. Jesus, being the bread of life, gave his all. Amen? Not 99%, not 99.9%. He gave his all, his blood, his water, his everything, his body broken, bloodshed. He gave everything, everything. So what's our response to Jesus then? Let me give you a half-hearted sacrifice, Jesus. Because since you took it all for me, I have a little bit of leeway giving you half. And then I, I live half myself. Imagine somebody being rescued from the water. They're about to die. They, they get rescued. They're like, thank you for rescuing me. But can you go back into the water because I left my bag there? Like, can you afford one more swim? Entitlement, pride, sin. Sin, friends. And the only answer to sin is the blood of Jesus that cleanses all sin. Only the blood of Jesus. Well, don't I have to do more good so that it outweighs the bad? Stop it. <laughs> uh, was that too, too direct? Uh, stop it, please, uh, gently speaking. Only the blood of Jesus can cleanse a soul that is tainted with sin and selfishness. And you see the selfless giving of our Lord and Savior, who is the bread of heaven, the bread of life, giving his all. And he says at that table, when he sits round with his disciples, this is my body broken for you. The bread that was given unto the Lord and then given to the priests were not half baked. At the same time, I believe half-baked Christianity is something like this. You want fire insurance because you've heard about hell, and you definitely don't want to go there. In my conversations in evangelism, I will talk about heaven and hell, and then I would ask them the question, so if you had a choice, either to be uh, with God for eternity and fellowship with him, uh, and, and, and worship and all of that? Or do you want to be stuck in a place where you'll burn? Like today, it's going to be kind of burning hot, but there's no death, no end to it. There's no community. There's no conversation. It's just death, but times that by infinity. I actually say this. Hell is something like this. Imagine the most painful experience that you've had on your body. You've broken a leg, broken a limb, or you've had some pain on the insides, and you, you times that by infinity, so that pain is so great, and then you time, yeah, yeah, that's good, good stuff, good stuff. Yeah. You times that by infinity so that there is no end to the pain. And then even a person that doesn't know Jesus, they'll be like, listen, pastor, or they'll call me by my name, I don't want to go to that place. How can I get to that place? But when I present Jesus, do you know what happens? Yeah, that's, uh, I don't know, because uh, that means I've got to give up my old way of life. 
That means I've got to let go of all the stuff that I liked before, and I've got to just do a new thing, like a new, new way of life. And that's where the rubber meets the road. I think there are far too many half-baked Christians who just don't want to go to hell. So they say, I believe in Jesus, but don't want to live that life of holiness, righteousness, and purity. And therefore, there is no power. No power. The Bible tells me, if you believe, you lay hands on the sick and they'll be made well. And many of the Christians or half-baked Christians, they're like, well, let me just um, gloss over that one. Uh, just that one. The miracles, I don't know. They probably stop, right? It's not scientific, so I, I don't know. Has, has Harvard done some research on that yet? I guess not. I haven't read any papers on that. So let's just move over, gloss over. When you take out the supernatural from the word of God, what do you have left? Nothing. How can God become flesh and not be born of a man? A virgin birth. How does that even make sense? And therefore, we, as a people of God, if we struggle with half-baked Christianity, then this might be a prayer for all of us. Lord, put me in your fire of love and turn me around. Uh, anyone want to pray that prayer? Lord, put me in your fire of love, in your furnace of love, and turn me around. Hallelujah. Where all the raw stuff becomes mature. Amen? With time, with fellowship, with worship, with the word of God, with the spirit of God, God turns us around. I, I pray that you're not here to be comfortable today. God's word is very challenging. And we need some raw meat. If you have a 30-year-old still on a bottle, that's a, a little bit of a problem. We need to grow a little bit today. And by the way, this message is for me. I want to grow. I'm humbled by the sacrifice my Lord gave on my behalf. Humble doesn't even scratch the surface. I'm in awe at the grace that I've received. I do not deserve his grace and forgiveness. I do not deserve to call him Abba Father. I do not deserve any of the graces that I have right now. I don't even deserve to be behind this pulpit. I don't deserve the grace that comes from the cross of Jesus Christ. And yet, God has given it to me freely. And all I needed to do was say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And it brings me to that point of just, I open myself up to you because, Lord, I can't figure this out. Your grace has overwhelmed me. So I don't come to you from a place of superiority. No, I come to you from a place of humility as I read the word of God and let the word of God read me. And for me, I can't afford to live a half-baked Christianity anymore. Not in light of what Jesus has done for me. And at the same time, that half-baked bread, it needs some more time in the fire, right? And there's always uh, the word of God which tells us about the fullness of time in God's time. Let me read you a couple of verses in Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 3. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. This is all in God's time, by the way. Not our time, not your time. What about Ecclesiastes 3.1? For everything, there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. Isaiah 40.31. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Psalm 27, 14. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. 
If the Lord is putting you back into the furnace, wait for him. Don't jump out of the fire. Don't compare yourself with anyone else. God has an individualized education plan for each of us. And it's picture perfect. He knows the unique buildup and the makeup of your life. He knows the exact time for you to be in that furnace, to be fully cooked for God's glory and for our joy. So I taught you the word lechem. What does lechem mean again? Bread. Bread. So in ancient times, like I mentioned, the bread, the flatbreads, you know, it was made being put in the fire. First on one side and then the other side. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we need to be uh, understanding of, of that kind of symbolism. But do you know that there's a word that we know in the Bible that has lechem in it, which is Beth lehem. Beth lehem is comprised of two words put together, bait, which is house or house of, and then lechem is what? Oh, bread, yes. <laughs> Bethlehem is the house of bread. But you know other, other words that has bait, bait in it, like Beth-el. Beth-el, which is the house of God. Also, what about Beth-thesda? The house of mercy. Chesed, right? Chesedah. So it's the house of mercy. Where did our Lord Jesus Christ come to this earth, where was he born? In Bethlehem, the house of bread. God nourished all humankind with the only nourishment that can fulfill this restless heart. So in the fullness of time, God sent his son to the house of bread. There is significance, friend. And where was the baby Jesus laid? In a manger. Now, the word manger is, uh, is the root word for mangia. Anyone know, know, know Italian? Oh, Sarah, mangia? Mangiare? Okay, yeah. Mangia, uh, it, it means to, to eat, but also the place to eat. The manger was the table. And the bread of heaven laid on that table in that manger that day to provide food for our souls. His name. Jesus, the bread of life. Jesus, who laid in that manger the place to eat, who laid in that manger that day the bread that will provide food for all humanity with the gospel, the good news of forgiveness, redemption, and reconciliation. So friends, are we heeding God's love this morning? That God would send his son to Beit Lechem, Bethlehem, the house of bread. And in the house of bread, there comes a baby who will say after 30 something years, I am the bread of life. After 33 years, he would lay his life down on the cross. So that we may be renewed and reconciled and redeemed, reformed. And released into a brand new destiny. Are you hearing the bread of life today speaking to you? Are you hearing his call so that we may not be half-baked bread? We must represent Jesus who laid down his life for his sheep. He is the true shepherd. The good shepherd. House of bread. The place that my Savior laid down. My goodness, he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And he laid in a manger, but there is significance which is connected to the table of showbread. Thank you, Jesus. For you are my life. For you have nourished me. And you have set me forth on a new trajectory of life and meaning and purpose. I did not deserve it. But even when I was deep in my transgressions, God's love went forth. And he died for me. And he rose again.
And friends, the bread of life is coming soon. Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming again. And until he comes, our response to the bread of life is not to live a half-baked Christian life. Our response is to say to the Lord, turn me over in the furnace of your love today so that I may represent you well, so that I may live a life that is fully turned over to you. Brothers and sisters, we have hope today. As the Holy Spirit ignites our hearts with conviction and knowledge and understanding, the Lord, the Lord, he will do a new work in us. And when we are squeezed in times of emergency and danger, guess what will come out of us? Jesus will come out of us. Squeeze an apple, comes out apple juice. Squeeze an orange, comes out orange juice. Squeeze a Christian that is not half-baked. Jesus will flow out. So you need not worry. Need not fear about $10 gas prices. Need not worry about the future. He is the Alpha and Omega who will take care of us. The beginning and the end. Remember Lechem. God came to bait Lechem in the manjia, in the place of eating. And now we eat of his body and drink of his blood and share in his suffering and his glory. Hallelujah. Can we give Jesus a clap in this? As the worship team joins me, let me pray for us. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the bread of life. Thank you for nourishing us with your word this morning. Help us not to be half-baked Christians. Help us to love you back by going back into that furnace as you call us and to be turned over. Not to be raw Christians, not to be half-baked Christians, O oh Lord, but to be mature, pleasing unto you as a sacrifice given on the table of showbread. Lord, if there is any leaven in our lives, any sin in our lives, any darkness in our lives, would you drive it out in Jesus' name right now, O oh Lord? And if there is any unidentified sins that we don't know about, may you bring it to light today in Jesus' name so that we may be a holy people unto you. If there are relationships, if there are financial ties, if there are certain anxieties that come our way and debilitate us, O oh Lord, give us wisdom to cut them in Jesus' name. May all the lies of the enemy be gone now in Jesus' name so that you would help us to be fully baked for your glory, fully mature. And Lord, we know we all have a long ways to go, but help us not to give up. Help us not to give in. We adore and love you and praise you, and may this word go deep into our souls for your glory and for our joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.